evening. So everyone, wow, I didn't know if I was going to be able to command all of your attention. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces and to have a packed house for this third installment of the Douglas Fisher Landscape of Urban Education Lecture Series this year. Um, our theme is Surveillance, Segregation in 21st Century Schools, Dismantling the School to Prison Pipeline. So we are honored to have Dr. Crystal Laura here with us this evening to talk about against the social ecology of school discipline, teaching for love, justice, and joy. My name is Marcel Haddix, and I'm the chair of the lecture series. I'm a professor in the School of Education. So again, I'm really excited to see so many faces, excited about the dialogue that we'll have this evening. We'll hear from Dr. Laura and then have some time for some questions uh, after her talk. I want to say a few things about Dr. Laura. Um, just reading her bio, but I had the pleasure of meeting her maybe two years ago because we both serve um, on the Affirmative Action Committee for the American Educational Research Association, which is the largest international um, organization for educational researchers in the world. Um, and so we have served together, and when I learned about her work and thinking about the series, I thought she would be a perfect person to bring here to share with us some of her experiences and the work that she's been doing in the Chicago area. So it really is a pleasure and an honor. Dr. Crystal Laura is an assistant professor of educational research leadership and co-director of the Center for Urban Research and Education at Chicago State University. And she's also a volunteer teacher at St. Leonard's Adult High School for formerly incarcerated men and women. Among her publications are Being Bad, My Baby Brother, and the School to Prison Pipeline. And we do have copies of her book for sale that she'll be signing at the end of her talk. So please check those out. And she's also the author of Diving In, Bill Ayers, or co-edited volume, Diving In, Bill Ayers, and the Art of Teaching into the Contradiction. By day, she explores teacher education and leadership preparation for learning in the context of social justice with the goal of training school professionals to recognize, understand, and address the school to prison pipeline. And during her second shift, which I love this part about her bio, she co-parents two marvelous boys who give her work in the field of education particular urgency. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Crystal Laura. Okay, thank you all so very much for coming. I'm sure you saw the technical difficulty, so in a moment I'm gonna ask you to sort of work with me as I figure out two or three different screens and four or five different microphones. Um, Thank you so very much for coming out. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Thank you, Marcel, um, my sister in the struggle for a more uh, joyful, a more just, a more loving world um, for that lovely introduction, and of course for inviting me to come here. Um, of course, I wanna give love to the people in the School of Education, particularly Dean Masangila, who, as I understand, is away conferencing right now. Um, AACPE, but I still want to um, make sure I acknowledge her for her support of the Bicklin Lec Lecture Series, continuing the tradition, and also for supporting the development of a year-long discussion around the realities of surveillance and segregation in 21st century schools. Um, I need to also show love to Jennifer Russo and her team for handling the logistics of getting me here, helping me work through the technical difficulties, um, and for creating that beautiful flyer which has been going around. Um, I'm, I'm sure that part, um, that was part of the reason that lots of people were lured into the room. So thank you, Jennifer, for pulling that together. And then of course, I wanna give love to all of you. Thank you so very much for showing up tonight. Um, at the end of your work day, your school day, your personal day, to hear me think out loud about the meaning and implications of dismantling the school to prison pipeline. I can't imagine a more relevant or urgent topic to discuss with you in this particular moment and in this particular place. Bless you. Here's a te technical difficulty. Y'all working with me? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so I can't imagine um, a more relevant or urgent issue to discuss with you at this moment and in this place 
because here we are at the end of Black History Month, right? Um, a time when many Americans across the U.S. pause at least for a brief moment to really consider our nation's troubled racial history, troubling racial history, um, our current conditions, and our future possibilities. Um, and we have the golden opportunity to really pause together in this esteemed institution, Syracuse University, to really think about what that means. Um, and I think it's particularly apropos that I'm here talking about this issue at this particular time and at this particular place because it was uh, just shy of 50 years ago on July 15th of 1965 when the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King came here to this campus for the second time and spoke in no uncertain terms about the educational problem facing Americans across the U.S., but particularly black folks in urban cities like Syracuse. <coughs> screens. <laughs> 1965. You'll remember, I think, that that was one year after the Civil Rights Act enabled the federal government to cut off federal funds from public entities, programs, and institutions that maintain racial discrimination. And <clears throat> back then, in 1965, um, Dr. King spoke to a packed house, much like this one, to a packed house at Sims Hall, and he explained to folks that although the pace of desegregation in southern schools was slow, that things weren't much better uh, north of the Mason-Dixon line. Anybody from major cities here, big cities? Hands? I'm a Chicagoan. So, I know, probably like many of you who raised your hands, that we sort of have this romanticism about big city living. We get really proud to say where we're from. But back then, Dr. King reminded us that um, at that particular time, cities like ours were plagued by all, all kinds of things, like uh, urban housing segregation, right? Uh, increased black migration was sort of a big deal at that time lack of job opportunities, um, uh, white flight to sub suburbs and private schools, these were all things that were impacting the acceleration of de facto desegregation in urban schools, like the ones that maybe many of us are familiar with. And Dr. King called these schools uh, ghetto schools. Now what were ghetto schools? These were schools that were not only racially homogenous and physically isolated from the rich diversity of America's populace, these were also schools that were offering young folk the poorest quality of education. These were schools that with each passing day led to more young people's frustrations than their futures and created more problems for children, families, and communities than they solved. These were schools from which one million children dropped out every year. These were schools where children who entered schools able to learn came out functionally illiterate and prepared for little more than dead-end jobs and a comfortable existence on the streets. Now, this is the kind of event where I'm amongst family, yes? So these are people, you are people who are eagerly and earnestly trying to understand what's going on, yes? So I feel comfortable saying what I think many of you are thinking, which is, in the last 50 years, ain't shit changed. <laughs> right? <clears throat> Except that In the 21st century, we are seeing and experiencing an age of mass incarceration that even the prescient Dr. King couldn't have dreamed. Because unlike King, we are living in a time when, as the professor Mark Lamont Hill argues, the prison is our go-to mechanism for isolation and containment. The central way that we adjudicate disputes and the primary site where we deal with social trauma and social dilemmas. I mean, how else can we explain the fact that right now, one in 31 American adults is under some form of correctional control? 
1 and 31. And by correctional control, I mean incarcerated on parole or on probation. There are over 2 million men and women locked up in the U.S., some of them at the Justice Center, just two miles away from this auditorium. And besides the extraordinary number of incarcerated people, an even bigger problem is that sometimes, and some of us, think that's normal. America of 2015 is a place that cages more of our people than any other country in the world, more black folks than were enslaved 165 years ago. This is the contemporary context, folks. And I know that you people at the university know that. But it's important for us as educators to really stay alive to our expanding prison nation. Not when somebody escapes. And not only when we catch a marathon of those juicy, addictive prison documentaries. Locked up, snap, locked down America. If you're old school like me, maybe cops, right? <clears throat> Don't act funny. I know y'all watch those. <laughs> but it's crucial for us to pay, attention to, pr pay attention to prisons partly because our profession and we are parties to barricading people in them. Y'all heard me. On every measure of academic attainment, earning a diploma, a GED or some form of post-secondary education, those who are incarcerated lag behind those of us in the free world. They have lower literacy levels, fewer marketable skills, and a greater prevalence of disability. With regard to education and schooling, incarcerated people are often those who from us once needed the most and somehow got the least. So my hope for the remainder of my time with you is that while Dr. King's 1965 reflection on segregated schools is sort of resonating in the back of our minds, that we keep our eyes open wide to our current situation, which is largely defined by jails and prisons that are so full of brown and black bodies that most everybody who knows what I'm talking about and has good sense is practically begging schools to stop feeding them. So I want to talk about the school to prison pipeline. Not only because that's what I was asked to come here and talk about, <laughs> but also because it strikes a special chord in me every time I meet someone, particularly someone in the field of education, who's never heard of the phrase. I'm trying to catch up, y'all. Now, you folks look smart, Syracuse University. And I've read some of the research done by faculty in your School of Education. So I know that justice-oriented, critical, uncomfortable conversations are happening on this campus. But go outside of this campus. Ask a teacher, a principal, a community member, a school board member, somebody who's unfamiliar with critical issues in urban education about the school to prison pipeline, and I bet that you can expect little more than a polite nod and smart use of context clues. No offense, I'm just saying. I've gotten that, uh, I don't know what you're talking about, but something tells me I should look more than a few times, okay? And to be frank, I assume that the problem is partly semantics. Let's be honest, school to prison pipeline is not part of our everyday parlance. Right? Um, and in fact, even across activist circles, the mind-blowing idea that kids get funneled from systems of education to system of criminal and juvenile justice has been captured by a number of other nifty metaphors. Off the top, I can think of three. I see folks taking notes, so write this down. One is schoolhouse to jailhouse track. Another is cradle to prison pipeline, cradle to prison pipeline. 
And another is school prison nexus. Schoolhouse to jailhouse track, cradle to prison pipeline, school prison nexus. Now, all three of these school to prison pipeline derivatives, if you will, highlight the fact that our profession is hardly the great equalizer that it's hyped up to be. Um, but I want you to know that as I'm describing them in turn, that each of these derivatives are like close cousins. They're not twins, right? They're a little different. And that's really important, not only because um, we, you know, not only because we want to be clear about our language, but we want to be clear about how to direct our efforts. So we want, to, we want to know how to name the issues that we're most engaged in better understanding and trying to address. We have to have the right language for it, have to figure out how to direct our efforts, and then how to know where to seek support. So let's talk about this first one. Because if, like me, you're really concerned with school-based policies and practices that help young people along to jails and prisons, then in addition to reading my book, <laughs> Being Bad, My Baby Brother in the School to Prison Pipeline, you have to look at reports published by the Advancement Project. Write that down. The Advancement Project is a multi, yeah, I'm a teacher, that's how, you know, that's what we do. The Advancement Project is a multiracial civil rights organization founded by a team of lawyers who've taken on a variety of social issues, like redistricting, redistricting voter protection, immigrant justice, and lucky for us, also the on-the-ground realities of zero tolerance. Now, I know you've had some access to information about the school, the, about the zero tolerance because our last speaker was here not long ago. When was our last speaker here? October. October. So we have some basis, so I'll try to be, br be brief. By now, zero tolerance in our schools and workplaces is as common as dirt. But most 80s babies, like me, and certainly not the 90s babies like some of you in the room, uh, are really too young to remember how things got this way. In the early 1990s, there, the, there was a spike in juvenile homicides. I'm going to keep it brief. Then a resulting public panic, fueled by racially coded media frenzy around teenage super predators. And then the passage of federal and state laws to meet them out. No worries. All of this could have easily gone over your heads. But the staff of the Advancement Project and others started putting out reports that really help us understand what it means when school adults have zero tolerance for children and youth in their buildings. To understand what it means when school adults have zero tolerance for young people is to first acknowledge that as absolute as zero tolerance sounds, we aren't equally intolerant of all kids. Of course, I won't argue that we should be, Right? The title of my talk tells you this much, but we really have to wonder, how is it that poor students, students of color, LGBTQ students, and students with disabilities are so frequently the ones who get the short end of the stick? I remember one semester, I taught a teacher ed course on urban educational policy, and the topic of bad kids emerged as a particular favorite among my students. Most everyone wanted to know how to run a tight ship stay sane and keep safe with so many troublemakers and class clowns in urban schools. And whenever I push people to unpack the beliefs embedded within this kind of philosophy and everyday language, things always got ugly. <laughs> Public schools were equated with city schools. City schools with cultural poverty and dysfunction. The stock story, stories commodified by the mainstream media, and I'm talking about the news, Hollywood films, cable network television, and the music industry, about pathological and dangerous youth poured. And the grapevine, oh, this is what happened to me, with this salacious tales from the field was tugged as proof positive that some children will inevitably fall through the cracks. As lively as these discussions were, no one ever seemed to want to address the connections between how we think and talk about children and how we treat them in social and academic contexts. A hush usually fell over the crowd when I suggested that demonizing ideology and discourse enables a whole web of relationships, conditions, and social processes, a social ecology of discipline 
which works on and through the youth who rub against our understanding of what counts as good students. Granted, these were young pre-service teachers who had very little, if any, direct experience with children in urban schools. So I'm guessing that part of their silence was rooted in pure ignorance. That's okay. It's also true, though, that challenging and unlearning what we assume we know about people, places, and things is uncomfortable. And that finagling around contradictions and tensions of implicit and explicit bias is easier than diving in and grappling with them. But that's exactly what I'm arguing that we need to do as educators, that we need to dive into the wreckage, as my own teacher and friend Bill Ayer says. Because if we don't, we will continue to build schools like Rosa Parks Elementary. That's a fake name for a real place where educational researcher Ann Ferguson found that black students of 10 and 11 years old, males in particular, were routinely and openly described as school adults who were described by school adults as at risk of failing, unsalvageable, and bound for jail. Help me out here, y'all. Sticks and stones may break my bones, Lies. Lies, y'all. Yeah, we, 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 we know that song, but I don't think it's true. And as soon as I find my slide, I'll tell you why. <laughs> because when our perceptions are so profoundly distorted, that we can think and utter these kinds of words about our students, then we have no trouble acting accordingly. Think about it. In a room of 30 students, with precious few resources to go around, and with regents and the alphabet soup of all the other state tests not far away, we have no space, no patience, zero tolerance for misbehavior. The problem, of course, is that what counts as misbehavior depends. For example, in schools and elsewhere, black boys are often refracted through cultural images of black males as both dangerous and endangered. And their transgressions are sometimes framed as different from those of other children. Black boys are what Ann Ferguson calls doubly displaced, meaning that as black children, they are seen, they're not seen as childlike, but adultified. Their misdeeds are made to take on a sinister, intentional, fully conscious tone that is stripped of any element of childish naivete. And as black males, they're often defined, I'm sorry, denied the masculine dispensation that white male students get as being naturally naughty. Instead, black boys are discerned as willfully bad. So then what do we do? We put them out, right? We put them out of class, we put them out of school, out of sight, out of mind. We suspend them, we punish them excessively for minor offenses, usually. And these are, you know, I'm sort of exaggerating here, but these were real examples, like talking, talking about a Hello Kitty bubble gun, hugging a friend, or chewing a Pop-Tart into the shape of a gun. I didn't make that up, y'all. In Chicago, where I live and work, zero tolerance policies in the district schools were abolished in 2006 in favor of more restorative approaches um, to harm and healing. But still, since then, the number of suspensions has nearly doubled. Black boys in my hometown are actually five times more likely to be suspended than any other group of students in the city's public school system. Black boys comprise 23% of the district student population but amount to 44% of those who are suspended and 61% of those who are expelled. Black boys are the only group of Chicago public school students whose suspension rates are higher in elementary school than in high school. Chicago has issues, right? 
Chicago is the epicenter, epicenter of neoliberal school reform, the third largest school district in the country, and one of the few districts without an elected school board. We've had over 100 neighborhood school closures since 2001, and an eightfold increase in money going to charters. 126 of our schools don't have libraries. You know what, don't even get me started because school politics in Chicago is really for another lecture. But let's be clear, Syracuse School District has its issues too. <laughs> Syracuse, I love this crowd, I love it. <laughs> Syracuse is among the most consistent and toughest districts in the nation just like Chicago, especially for elementary school children, where discipline disparities by race and ability are largest in the least serious category and for the most subjective reasons, like disrespect, defiance, and disruption. What does that mean? <laughs> but the problem is much bigger than Chicago, it's much bigger than Syracuse. Because when we have zero tolerance for our kids, we not only suspend them, but we expel them. We not only suspend them and expel them, but we arrest them. In schools, we've constructed booking stations in the buildings. Y'all know about this? To make school-based arrests easier, faster, more effective. When we have zero tolerance for our kids, we lose all concept of kids being kids wiggling, jumping, giggling, fidgeting, being silly, somehow these things get diagnosed and labeled and medicated. And when that doesn't work, we beat them. Yes, I said beat them. Because in 20 states, corporal punishment is still allowed. That means that we use paddles, whips, straps, yardsticks, Thankfully, in Illinois, it doesn't exist anymore because I still have bad dreams of my first grade teacher, Miss Smith, and her yardstick, which she affectionately called Dr. Be Good. Jeez. Okay, but when we have zero tolerance for kids and their misbehavior, we even find them. Back home, Nar Noble, a school called Noble Charter Schools Network, collects about $200,000 annually from student discipline fees. $5 per infraction for things like missing a button on your shirt or being seen with a bag of chips, hot chips in particular, or not looking someone in the eye or not looking standard American vernacular, right? It's an attack on Ebonics. And add that to the revenue from a summer behavior class at $140 per registrant and you've got yourself a promising fundraiser on the backs of poor black students. And it's also a smart strategy for weeding out bad kids. Because if you can't pay, you have two choices. You repeat the grade level or you leave. Call me crazy, but that doesn't sound noble to me. <laughs> and if the kids for whom we have zero tolerance have not yet felt unwelcome or so dehumanized that they drop out, we transfer them to other schools or we counsel them out toward programs like the Job Corps, what has been called the U.S. Department of Labor, Labor's boarding school for the bottom of society, and what I would argue is an intermediary or a pit stop in the schoolhouse to jailhouse track. But I, and I could go on, but I think you get the point here, which is that these school policies and practices are systems of surveillance, exercises of power used to continuously and purposefully monitor undesirable youth. Now, I'm clearly a black woman. I'm a mother of two beautiful black sons, and I'm speaking here on Black History Month. So you'll understand why I'm particularly attuned to the ways that schools wound black boys. Black boys are unevenly punished and tracked into educational disability categories in their early years. Practices that tend to reinforce the very problems that they intend to correct. And although this is enough to make reasonable people want to holler, even more insidious is when those under surveillance internalize the experiences and labels assigned to them. When they believe that exclusion and isolation is de defensible, and when they learn to condition themselves. 
then black boys who've been sorted, contained, and then pushed out of schools become black men. Men whose patterns of hardship are pronounced and deeply entrenched. Men who constitute nearly 50% of the adult males in, prop in prison. Men who have been well primed for neither college career nor full participation in our democracy, but instead for punitive institutionalization. That is what the schoolhouse to jailhouse track tries to show us. And if you are moved by this, if something in what I just said resonates with you, then I would hope that you try to figure out ways to embed your work, to frame your work in ways that will deliberately and explicitly address the schoolhouse to jailhouse track. For those of you who want to envision a different way of schooling, who want to situate your teaching and your activism in dismantling the schoolhouse to jailhouse track, in reframing your work in such a way that the school is not a place of punishment, that the school doesn't label more young people L LD and BD than it does PhD and JD, that the school is not the primary gateway to menial label, the streets, and permanent detention, your job then is to yearn for and create the kinds of schools that young folks don't need to recover from. So let's think about the cradle to prison pipeline. Perhaps some of you are not school based. Maybe you're a pre service teacher or community activist of some sort. Um, or maybe you're just more, much more concerned about what's happening outside of schools and how that shapes the lives of young people who are in them. Those of you with these kinds of concerns should study up on the cradle to prison pipeline. Because Marion Wright Edelman and the advocates at the Children's Defense Fund, that's for your notes, <laughs> trademark the cradle to prison pipeline to help us wrap our minds around not just school-based predictors of incarceration, but a host of other factors. In a seminal report, Edelman writes, and I'll read at length, So many poor babies in rich America enter the world with multiple strikes already against them. Without prenatal care and at low birth rate, born to a teen, poor, or poorly educated single mother and absent father, at crucial points in their development from birth through adulthood, more risks and disadvantages accumulate and converge that make a successful transition to productive adulthood significantly less likely and involvement in the criminal justice system significantly more likely. In other words, some children are born on a path to prison. They aren't derailed from the right track. They haven't been given a fighting chance to get on it. Of all the school to prison pipeline metaphors, the cradle to prison pipeline is probably the least off-putting for most people after the visceral sort of sensation of the imagery has passed. Personally, credit to prison pipeline is a bit too self-flagellating for my taste, uh, too straight shooting in its emphasis on everything that poor families don't have and presumably will never have, or what they have, what they do have, but they shouldn't. Not that sugarcoating the devastation of poverty will make it more palatable, but I can just see it now, all the Neil Bill Cosby's of the world Sashay, sashaying on their soapboxes, armed with the Chicago, uh, Children's Defense Fund uh, reports urging the poor, understood as the black poor, to pull themselves up and come on people. In fairness, I do realize that there are other layers to this metaphor, and I want to focus on those. So I'll just go ahead and turn down the volume, <laughs> way down on the bootstrap rhetoric, so I can sort of free up the mental space where I can think about them. If all I took from the term cradle to prison pipeline was permission to attack adults who make choices that create chaos for kids, then I'd be missing the point entirely. Beside the fact that choices are linked to power, the more or less power you have, the greater or fewer choices there are available, there are, they are rarely decided upon in a vacuum. What the cradle to prison pipeline, this is a really important point, y'all, what the cradle to prison pipeline really tries to holistically critique is a broad range of structural conditions 
under which extraordinarily fa extraordinary family dysfunction and a route to nowhere makes logical sense. It rails against macroeconomic policies and practices like those inadequately regulating preventative health care, affordable housing, and living wage work as flat out wrong and gravely dangerous. These are barriers which the late Jean Anion, y'all know her work? Which the late Jean Anion argues in her classic books that no school-based policy or practice can surmount. As Edelman writes, without significant interventions by families, community elders, institutions, policy and political leaders, and folks like you, to prevent and remove these multiple accumulated obstacles, so many poor and minority youths are and will remain trapped in a trajectory that leads to marginalized lives, imprisonment, and premature death. Now, if these issues rub you the wrong way, and they should, then you might find ways to name, map, and work with young people to address the broad social context that's impacting a child's ability to get on and stay on an academic path. I suggest that you couch your work as explicitly focused on dismantling the cradle to prison pipeline. I'm suddenly reminded of Michelle Alexander's masterful book, The New Jim Crow, about why mass incarceration is another piece of this larger social order in need of altering. Alexander argues that much like slavery and Jim Crow of our not so distant past, mass incarceration functions as a, as a sophisticated system to relegate black folks to second class citizenship. Here in a nutshell is how Alexander says the system works. First, the police stop, interrogate, search and round up an unprecedented number of people, primarily poor men of color, for dr minor drug crimes. Second, defendants have generally weak legal representation and strong pressure to plead guilty, which they often do, whether they are or not especially when prosecutors use their prerogative to pile on extra charges. Third, after spending a great deal of time under correctional supervision, in jail or prison, on probation or parole, the vast majority of convicted offenders are released back into their communities with little more than a bus ticket. Forget rebuilding lives. They will never be integrated into mainstream society. Alexander reminds us they will be discriminated, discriminated against legally for the rest of their lives, denied employment, housing, education, and public benefits. Assisted by public consensus, white supremacy, and the criminal justice system, most will eventually return to prison and then be released again, caught in the closed circuit of perpetual marginality. I don't know about you, but I don't know what to do with myself when I read this kind of stuff. Except maybe wait by the phone for my brother's call, hug my sons a little tighter, and then rush off to write or teach or lecture like lives depend on it. All of this before resettling eventually in my cozy roost with some other disturbing manuscript to plow through. Not long before the new Jim Crow, it was my friend and colleague Erica Miner's right to be hostile that rocked my world. The book unpacks what activists and scholars have referred to as the prison industrial complex or the politics and business of corrections which minors claim schools are parties to. To build the case, which is persuasive from the get-go, she points out that some schools look and feel an awful lot like prisons. Let's stop for a minute to consider this. When I think about, pri when I think about prisons, and I try to figure out what are their sort of, you know, primary markers, what identifiers come to mind, what things do you think Come to my mind. Security, for sure. What else? Okay. Routines. The cells, the actual structures. Uniforms. Excellent. Privatization. These are all things, thank you for, for helping me with this. These are all things that come to my mind when I think of prisons. I think of being constantly ID'd. Um, you, you'll read in the book or maybe hear about someone else talking about the book that I wrote 
um, which is primarily organized around me trying to understand how it could be that here I am, a PhD, and I have a brother who is locked up for many, many years um, in an Illinois state prison. So I'm much, much too familiar with uh, each of these three derivatives of the food or prison pipeline, and I'm also much too familiar with how prisons look and feel. And I'm constantly thinking about this whole emphasis and obsession with IDs. IDs have to be worn. You have to be ID'd five, six times before you get where you're trying to go. Uniforms, dress code for sure, surveillance camera, police dogs, armed guards, metal detectors, strip searches. Every time my brother comes in to see me, if he needs to get up to go to the washroom, he has to be researched. Uh, um, researched. Um, I'm thinking of the next book I want to write. Um, <laughs> He has to be searched over and over again. So, so strip searches, physically in uninviting facilities. These are all things that I think about when I'm trying to sort of focus in on prisons. But what's really interesting is that the same exact list occurs to me when I think about schools, particularly urban schools. I think about obsession with IDs. I think about uniforms and dress, particularly noble charter schools with the buttons and the funds, surveillance cameras. We spent more money on surveillance cameras in the, in the past several years than we have on correctional facilities. Police dogs sniffing in between our children's legs. Armed guards. We have regular police officers. We have what are euphemistically referred to as school resource officers. We have security guards. Metal detectors that take young people forever to get through before they actually get into the school. Strip searches actually happen in our schools as well. And of course, um, our environments, uh, the school buildings actually leave much to be desired. So Miners begins her book at this place, mulling over some of these characteristics. And then she builds upon some of the contemporary research that we just went over a few minutes ago around the school-based practices um, that facilitate the movement to prisons and jails. And then she finally widens the frame to show interconnections among education, incarceration, and other important forces. For example, she describes changes in the welfare state and other economic shifts over the past three decades, explaining mysteries like stagnation in education-related funding alongside ballooning resources for prisons and policing. Basically, she says that mainstream media, private companies, and poor rural communities where many of these prisons are located, they depend on, they need these prisons. And they count on us as educators to help them fill them. She riffs on the creation of sex offender registries to show how schools um, legitimate concepts such as the child that require protection and more expansion of the prison industrial complex. She addresses the construction and management of ide identities. So just as our schools produce gifted children, successful learners, good kids, we simultaneously require and produce the inverse. We need remedial learners. We need educational failures. We need bad seeds and more, yes? Miner's book is hard going, so just in case you folks are going to pick it up, I will let you know in the door. But it is so helpful because it really uh, helps us imagine, conceptualize, and understand the material movement of young people from school to jails as neither neat nor direct. So for these reasons, she foregoes pathway metaphors altogether. And she describes hers as a school prison nexus. So there are several ways then to talk about the school to prison pipeline, each offering a rather different lens. Schoolhouse to jailhouse track enables a heavy analysis of what's happening in schools, what harmful policies and practices teachers, principals, and superintendents have some latitude to redress. Cradle to prison pipeline paints many systemic issues with broad strokes to highlight points of conflict and opportunity in family, community, and national priorities. And school prison nexus pushes us to confront and debunk an even bigger carceral state, carceral state at work, and what it means for schools and school children. Now that we have some common language and a sense of the various components that make up the social ecology of discipline within which we operate, for just a little while, um, I want to keep riffing. Because um, I really want you all to have the opportunity to sort of talk back to me and unlike Marshawn Lynch, I really do want to take your questions, right, <laughs> and answer them. Um, so 
let us think for just a little bit, a short while, about what it will take to dismantle the school to prison pipeline, regardless of where our commitments lie. Whether your commitment is in schools, schoolhouse to jailhouse track, your commitment is in sort of social activism, cradle to prison pipeline, or if your commitment is in anti-prison work, school prison nexus. Jennifer said, I'm going to sit next to you because something's going to happen. <laughs> Jennifer said, that's not English. the last one. Look, I need a show of hands. Where are the techno people in the room <laughs> to help me and Jennifer figure this out? There it is. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Let's look. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Did you get it? Yay! All right. You all cannot understand how excited I am right now. Hold on. You're going to wrap it up. You're going to wrap it up. There it is. Thank you. So here's what I want to do. So I'm going to give you all some space and some time to talk to me and ask me questions and all of that. But before we do that, I want to just end very briefly right here. And I want to title this final portion of my remarks, Getting intimate. What a sexy, provocative way to be lured into a serious reflection, right? On the social context of education and contemporary schools. There are perhaps other titles that more appropriately define the current moment that we're in, but I'm good with getting intimate because it feels good. And at a time of standardization, accountability, and corporate style reform, when routine and detachment from the messiness of teaching and learning are the only surefire ways to keep your job and your sanity, getting intimate suggests a bold and dangerous path forward. But for the next 10 minutes, I promise I won't go longer than that, I, I'm going to make a short pitch for why we should do it anyway. For why love, justice, and joy in education are dangerous and worthwhile pursuits. And I've been told that after 10 minutes, a bullhorn will politely signal the time for me to pass the mic. So I'm going to keep my remarks to just those three quick points, love, justice, joy. These are the, the three concepts that better explain exactly what I mean when I suggest that we, teachers, teacher educators, administrators, and anyone else who cares deeply about the social and academic lives of young people ought to consider letting a commitment to intimacy guide our work against the prison pipeline. Point one, love. To explore this first idea, I want to start out with a little experiment. When I say love, what comes to mind? Now, we are right after Valentine's Day. I know some people have some conceptions of love in here. Pa family, passion, say more, caring, affection. I feel like I don't have enough. I need to come over here. Love, hugs, friendship, support, thank you. All of these are perfectly sensible, wonderful descriptors and ideas of what love means. And I got 
all kinds of pictures of things that represented those ideas on Facebook uh, around Valentine's Day. But I got to say that I posted something a little different. I posted two pictures, I'm sorry, one picture of two books. Both of them written by Bell Hooks, one of our giants. Because she has this trilogy of books, three different books that focus all about love. And what I was trying to convey there was her basic idea that love for many of us is not really a feeling. It's not something that's mystical. It's not even something that's affective, but that it's instead action. It's the action that we take to enhance or alter our own or someone else's lives. And I love that. I love that understanding of love. Right off the bat, I think that without any deep theoretical discussion, love seems inextricably connected to the world of education and schools, teaching and learning. Feminist scholar Beth Brandt tells us, who we are is written on our bodies, our hearts, our souls and that in each of us there is a desire to be known and felt, to be acknowledged and validated and to have our histories confirmed, to be witness for what has been and what is to be. Witnessing as an act of love involves the deliberate attendance to people, seeing and taking notice of that which they believe is meaningful. Fears and desires are situated in a sense of past and future and experiences become the fabric of time and space. To witness is to validate the existence of stories and to protect their places in the world. We are acting as witnesses when we participate in knowing and learning about others, engage within constructions of truth and communicate what we have experienced to others. Witnessing is qualitatively different from simply observing or looking at people. I'm reminded of the 90s flick, White Man Can't Jump. Anybody seen that? It's an old flick. When one of the main characters, Sidney, claims to his counterpart, Billy, that he can't possibly hear the rich messages and music of Jimi Hendrix. Look, man, Sidney says, you can't listen to Jimi. Say that differently. You can listen to Jimi, but you can't hear him. There's a difference, man. Just because you're listening to him doesn't mean you're hearing him. Does anybody remember this scene? It's hilarious. We might make a similar distinction between watching and, and witnessing. When we show our love for young people, our students and their families, by witnessing their lives, we are complicit in active and partial meaning making about those experiences, up close and personal, brazenly in their business. It means that we want to know what pleases and interests them what saddens and shuts them down, what they are curious about, what sets their souls on fire. While it is impossible to really know other people or completely understand what's happening to them, the act of witnessing is an invitation to pay attention, to reflect, to learn about lived lives, and to explore rationalizations of people's, ex people's experiences. There's a particular urgency for the act of witnessing within the context of marginalization or wrongdoing. Being a spectator of calamities taking place both near and far is a quintessential part of the modern experience. I think of the recurrent theme in slave narratives and the writings of Holocaust survivors who describe the trauma of public indifference to their struggles. The persistent feeling of invisibility and being made mute as equally egregious assaults. At a minimum, bearing witness To the pain of significant others is the act of validating and advancing their fundamental rights to peace, fairness, and humanity. We do this by watching closely in the particular context in which our people try to make sense of things. We listen intently and provide a captive audience for critical reflections on the tough questions of guilt and responsibility. Dory Law warns, the absence of an empathic listener or more radically, the absence of an addressable other, I love that, an addressable other, an other who can hear the anguish and thus affirm and recognize their realness annihilates the story. For Laub and for me as well, the act of listening is vital to the production and co-ownership of people's truth, but it's also the obligation of engaging the conversation that's central to the process of getting intimate. This is what I'm trying to describe, y'all. 
of trying to understand and subscribe to myself and to you all what it takes to get intimate with young folks in a way that will narrow the corridor to the school to prison pipeline. Y'all still with me? Engaging points us, to, points us to the posing of problems and the highlighting of contradictions that are inherent to all experience of the people world. To engage is to put people in deliberate dialogue around the mundane, the taken for granted, the whispered and the hushed. When we engage, we publicly name what we have witnessed and draw upon multiple vantage points, including our own lenses and perspectives, for a fuller and more complicated understanding of people's issues. Jawanza Kanjufu um, has offered many books on the condition of African American males, the most popular being Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. Do we know this series? It's okay if you don't, but if you do, um, or if you don't, I, want, I would like for you to check it out when you get a chance. So this guy, Jawanza Kanjufu, is often considered a separatist, a man of many opinions and few credentials, but quite honestly, I think he raises some pretty good points. And one is, you cannot teach a child you do not love. You cannot teach a child you do not respect, and you cannot teach a child you do not understand. And this is, I think, one of the most critical elements necessary for the creation of a safe and productive learning environment. That was point one. Point two, justice. So you already know that I'm a mom of two beautiful boys, but I'm also a teacher educator at a comprehensive university, no worries. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> I have a team here. <laughs> Love it. I, I'm a teacher at a comprehensive university on the far south side of Chicago. And before that, um, I taught on and off at a variety of places, but also to incarcerated folks who are returning to earn a high school diploma. I teach there on Mondays. Love those folks. And before that, I worked with youth however I could as a mentor, a tutor, a sub substitute teacher. All the while, in each of those capacities, I like to see myself as not only as a teacher, but as a teacher activist. And I want to invite you to think about what that might mean for you. Because that concept, too, carries particular meanings. Intuitively, the phrase teacher activist conjures sort of, you know, derogatory images, right? Images of fist pumping, it doesn't help that I have this fro today, right? But fist pumping, community organizing, you say it does help, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> fist pumping, community organizing, car carrying union folks, and I am one of those too. Being a teacher in Chicago where there's a, an abundance of educational issues to be moved by, I resonate with this vivid portrayal. Yet again, I see teacher activists as suggesting something in particular, something useful for our purposes of thinking through uh, what getting intimate might mean and look like in our workspaces. Let me riff parenthetically on the concerns and context of teacher activists as a prelude to this point on justice. Schools in the U.S. historically serve certain public goals that teachers are instrumental to meeting, the political, which asks teachers to indoctrinate patriotic citizens. So don't let nobody tell you that schools are not political spaces, right? The social, which asks teachers to foster responsible, independent, law-abiding community members. And the economic, which asks teachers to prepare young people for the labor force and the free market. Teacher activists who are considered a special kind of teacher go about achieving these goals in unique ways. Foremost to teacher activists is educational reform that contributes to equity in outcomes for students, schools, and the wider community. This means that inside of the classroom, teacher activists push themselves and their students to examine matters of importance to them, to ask why things are the way they are, to analyze who benefits from the status quo, and to explore possibilities for changing conditions they don't like. Outside the classroom, teacher activists rely upon a variety of methods and outlets to provoke dialogue for transformation, including writing, petitioning, rallying, demonstrating, volunteering, lobbying, and more. The strategy is to do what can be done within the confines of the school building and then complement that work with whatever efforts can happen elsewhere.
to understand this micro, macro approach to teaching and learning, it's really helpful to know that teacher act activists are unabashed skeptics. I'm okay with that. That is to say they are intentional about identifying their own and others' assumptions, seeking alternatives, and making conscious choices for their practice. It's also true that teacher activists seriously doubt the overarching narrative of schooling and education for a more democratic society. Teacher activists support the ideal, of course, but recognize the current reality. In fact, what gives rise to teacher activism is the existence of glaring inequities, intolerance, exclusion, and otherwise marginalizing conditions around them. Naturally, the idea of teachers as activists makes many people uncomfortable. Teachers may fact function in any of the familiar roles that are formally and informally assigned to them as a mentor, a parent, a guide on the side, a, a sage on the stage, an advocate, a counselor. But in the current era of standardization, accountability, and corporate style schooling, activists is often understood as code for polemic. It's not uncommon for teacher activists to take flack from colleagues or supervisors for paying too much attention to what's going on outside of the classroom, presumably at the expense of what's happening inside of it. To that critique, teacher activists might reply in recognition and defense of the crucial interplay between content and real world context for teaching and authentic learning. Other stakeholders in the teaching profession, politicians and policymakers, for example, may, may claim that teacher activists proselytize. Teacher activists are too radical, too political. To that concern, teacher activists would say something to the order of what Patricia Henchy articulated. There is no such thing as a politically neutral school, and there is no such thing as a politically neutral teacher. The question is not whether particular ideologies are being promoted, but which ones are, and how well we like them. Given these sociopolitical contexts, it's reasonable to wonder why teacher activists engage in this kind of work. Now, I tend to borrow from sociologist C. Wright Mills. Teacher activists do not see a neat split between their work and their lives. They take both too seriously to allow such separation, and they want to use each for the enrichment of the other. Teacher activists might be considered I'm sorry, teacher activists draw on a wide range of frameworks. Some of these would be familiar to many of you. Multiculturalism, critical theory, theories of care, spirituality, love, multidimensional ethical theory, theories of participatory democracy, and anti-oppressive education to make sense of and reconcile the duality. Dantley and Tellman capture many of these theoretical lenses with five specific, you know, teachers are all, all about giving signposts five specific characteristics that clarify the definition, application, and requirements of teachers as activists. One, a consciousness of the broader social, cultural, and political context of schools. Two, the critique of the marginalizing behaviors and predispositions of schools and their leadership. Three, a commitment to the more genuine enactment of democratic principles in schools. Four, a moral obligation to articulate a counter vision or narrative of hope regarding education. And five, a determination to move from rhetoric to civil rights activism. What teacher activists are after is social justice. Teacher activists might be considered what some call transformative or public intellectuals. Public, <laughs> love this crowd. Yes, love this crowd. <laughs> Public intellectuals recognize the demanding labor of pushing back on institutions that help to maintain the social, political, and economic status quo. They are compelled to engage these issues anyway on the basis of a particular principle assumed to be universal that all human beings are entitled to expect decent standards of behavior concerning freedom and justice from worldly powers and nations. 
and that deliberate or inadvertent violations of these standards need to be testified and fought against courageously. There are no hard and fast rules, people, to follow in expressing these kinds of commitments in either overt or less rec recognizable ways. But as public intellectuals, teacher activists take on a responsibility, as Saeed says, to raise embarrassing questions, to confront or orthodoxy and dogma rather than to produce them, to be someone who cannot be easily co-opted by schools or governments or corporations and whose reason de tour is to represent all those people and issues that are routinely forgotten or swept under the rug. At bottom of this, rec this is a recognition that education can and should be for enlightenment and liberation. However it is defined, in order for teachers to meaningfully ground their work in activism, certain resources are necessary. One is each other. This is why a space like this is so very crucial. But we also need strategies, we need revolutionary ones in some contexts for rethinking and taking leadership for social practices to better meet diverse student needs. All educators need the language to translate intellectual context into practice and experiential under understandings. We need guidance, we need encouragement, we need examples, we need support, right? to lead these kinds of discussions with policymakers and people with the power of the pen and the purse. We also need scholarship, which is why this place uh, and what you're doing is really um, important to lean on for sustenance and perspective. Point three, joy. I'm running out of time. So I'll keep this point direct. All of us tend to get so caught up in the difficulties of our work that we forget education is the most terrific, impactful, interdisciplinary profession there is. We forget that our job is to give students, the teachers, philosophers, doctors, scientists, attorneys, firefighters, and more of the future in education that is responsive to their identity and cultural backgrounds. This is part of the intimate labor in which educators can and should engage. Getting intimate means giving a damn. Worrying about what happens to people in our everyday lives. It means attending to their individual needs, perspectives, and interests by asking the basic questions, y'all. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. It means accepting that the answers to these questions may bring an uneasy and jarring level of consciousness to the ways in which we receive, recognize, and respond to others and ourselves. It means organizing our work around caring a bad word in education? Caring. For human affections, weaknesses, and anxieties to get to know people in all of their particularity. And then our challenge is to connect what we know with what we do. Getting intimate means teaching and learning in the spirit of community and in solidarity, or as my mother once said, being willing to walk the path with you. In the final analysis, Getting intimate requires every adult who works with young folks in our education system to love and respect children, to wake up each day to struggle and strive towards social justice and to find joy and pleasure in it all or to go do something else. Thank you. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Can I, can I take some thoughts, questions, concerns? <laughs> no. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that part of what we're dealing with here is a narrative of urban schools um, that not only frames the schools themselves 
and the young people in them, but you. Because then the question then becomes, why are you in that school? Right? Or you're here. Right, so you have all kinds of assumptions about you. Marcel actually has a, a really interesting presentation and, and analysis about people asking, why are you in that community? Why are you in that particular school? And I think that the suggestions that I just offered, I think, are really useful in all of these contexts. But certainly, you should be clear with people about why you're there, right? You should be clear about your commitments to these things or other things. You be, should be clear about your commitment to that space, to this work, and be unabashed about that. I think part of our issue is, as educators is that you know, we're so afraid of all of the things that are coming down that bear on us from external forces. We're so afraid of being seen as political, as people who are activists, and that being sort of a pejorative statement, that we feel uncomfortable expressing what we genuinely feel, which is, I'm in this space because I'm good at it. I'm here because I'm good at what I do. I love what I do. And this space is no different from any other, by way of the chosen anyway, right? These kids are good kids, right? I would also hope that every person in this room, when you, when you leave here, uh, I hope that you're sort of empowered to, to check the language. Because you know, as you notice, part of what I've done here is pay close attention to discourse. I want us to be really clear about language. Some people say that's persnickety. I'm cool with that. Some people say that's picky. But I think it's really, really important for us to be clear about what we think we're talking about so that we can articulate that to other people in ways that are, that are authentic to what, what it is that we're really trying to say. It's not, it's not OK to nod and say, yeah, I know what you're talking about if you really don't. Be that person that says, no, actually, when I say I'm in this space and I'm saying that I'm here because of love, I'm saying that I'm here because I feel like I have something to both give and receive, right? I feel like I'm going to be the kind of teacher who, um, who privileges the fact that I'm going to learn as much as I teach. So I think in a roundabout way, I'm simply saying uh, that you should feel comfortable saying what it is, which is that there is that this narrative is problematic in these ways, and you should just sort of develop the language to, to express that. Thank you for the question. Sorry. Is this way? Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you for everything that you've been saying so far. Thank you it's for great. coming. Um, my question is about praxis, you know, moving oh. things out of the theoretical realm into like more pragmatic real world applications. Because, like, f from my understanding, especially because I've been through the education system, obviously I'm still here at SU, about a lot of the systemic forms of discrimination are produced because of the investments that education has in itself. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, how racism, homophobia, transphobia, um, sexism, Islamophobia, ableism, et cetera, et cetera, gets reproduced through the educational um, almost industrial complex. And one thing I can think of is like when I was in second grade and having to say the Pledge of Allegiance for like na like nationalist reproduction and simultaneously that same exact day learning that the founding fathers in their humanitarian efforts were simultaneously slave owners. Mm -hmm. That I was tradable just like a Game Boy Advance. Mm. So what would you suggest not only in terms of having, using the approach of love, justice, and joy um, for the recognition of humanity, but also fundamentally restructuring what, how, and why we think okay. in the educational system? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, a couple of things come to mind. One is, my, when I laid out those three points, my hope was that you would, uh, you would sort of feel an abstract nature to it so that wherever you are, you can figure out how to best apply that in your setting. So if your interest is trying to figure out how these different isms manifest themselves in your particular setting, you can think, well, what, is, what would love look like in this space, right? How can I ab advocate active, you know, like be an activist for justice work in this particular space? What, in fact, does joy look like in this space? So yes, I agree with you that part of what I'm offering is um, more of an abstract understanding of these concepts that I hope that you will find ways to apply um, in a practical way. But I think in terms of understand, understanding um, you know, involuntary su subordination, all kinds of racialized subordination, we need to understand that they have certain characteristics, common characteristics. 
and two of them are, one is sort of secrecy, right? There's a level of secrecy in each of those isms that, tell me your name, Coy. that Coy just mentioned. Each of those isms have a level of secrecy. There are things happening that are less overt than we would like them to be. So that when you call them out, what happens? Individually, if you call out these things, because these isms have a level, level of secrecy, you look like the crazy person in the room. Y'all with me? <laughs> right? So if we understand that isms have a level of secrecy in addition to a level of social investment that's connected to people's inherent individual tensions, then we have, a, we have sort of difficulty, we have some trouble leveraging those ideas from an individual basis. So part of what I always do is say, link up. Find all the folks who are doing good work. What are the organizations out here who are doing work on each of those isms? Locate yourself. Find your people. Who are the folks in this room who care about the issues who you, that you care about? Find those folks. Try to figure out how to make both individual choices that happen in your classroom that are, are you a teacher yet? Or are you a? What for? So we got folks even from beyond the School of Education. Love to you. Um, so wherever you are, that you find ways to be both individually useful but also link up with people who have a broader agenda so that you are not the crazy person in the room yelling racism. <laughs> but instead, you are a part of a community of people who recognize and are trying to find ways to make more visible these sort of secret isms. So I, mean, I really hope, I, I appreciate the comment about praxis. I really hope that everybody finds ways to think about each of those three derivatives of the school to prison pipeline in very specific ways through love, justice, and joy. But I think part of it will depend on where you are, your ability to say, I'm in this space because I'm good at it and because this is what I love to do, and your ability to link up with other good folks who are also trying to do good work. Thank you, Corey. I think we all acknowledge that we're living in a time when, um, when standards, when, when teacher education standards by way of colleges and universities, um, teacher education standards by way of alternative roads to teaching, TFA, right, Teachers for America, um, when corporate models of schooling are really creating expectations um, and really a profile of what uh, an urban teacher looks like. And to be frank, it doesn't include any of the things that I just mentioned. Which speaks directly to your point, that there are lots of people who are proliferating and populating our profession who are well-intentioned, wonderful, lovely people, presumably, but don't have the training, maybe not the experience, maybe not the natural inclination to claim the kinds of things that we've been talking about. So the question is, what do you do about those folks? Partly, right? That's part of the question. And the other part of the question is, how do you build up the folks who are committed to these things? Um, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, 
what comes to mind um, are the people who I know who are trying to do both. So maybe I'll answer this one with just a couple of examples. There is a, a school called Village Leadership Academy. My reference point is Chicago, because that's, I'm a Chicagoan, that's what it is. But there is an independent school called Village Leadership Academy that is, it started off as a, a, a daycare, basically, and then the love for the school grew so quickly, the school, the student body grew so quickly that it became a primary school, pre-primary school. Then it became a primary school, and now they're working on a high school but it is an explicitly justice-oriented space. So you can go into a classroom of kindergartners and they will have the kind of conversation that I just had with you. No lie. They are Googleable, they are on YouTube. The point is there are people who are trying to build what we want on their own. And not, they're not waiting for TFA to figure it out. They're not waiting for colleges of education to have less pressure on them for how they will conduct the, the preparation of their teachers and their leaders. They're building their own models for what they want to see and the kinds of schools that they want for their children. So I think that one, one response to how do you grow this work is to grow this work, right? Um, like Nakisha Hobbs, who's the principal of this um, particular school. So, but the other question of you know, how do you deal with the fact that there are so many instance, institutions, programs, elements of this that are not sort of justice oriented. You know, I'm, I'm at an in institution that's really, um, it's on the far south side of Chicago. As, as Marcel said earlier, I'm the co-director of the Center for Urban Research and Education. And part of what we do is acknowledge that we're this little island on the far south side servant, it's a predominantly black institution, is a real opportunity to have these kinds of critical conversations on a regular basis. So we create the programs that we want to see. So we have professional development opportunities for teachers around the school to prison pipeline. Well, Chicago Public Schools isn't going to offer that kind of PD. We will. No worries. We got this. We want teachers to be culturally responsive, to be culturally relevant, to be culturally sustaining. Chicago Public Schools isn't going to offer that. No worries. We will. So, you know, what I think what we're trying to do is make a conscious attempt to build the kind of teachers, prepare the kind of educators and leaders that we feel comfortable leaving our babies with. At least that's how I approach my work. So, Certainly there are issues of sustenance, there are issues of um, uh, uh, burnout, there are issues of how do, you, how do you build people up who do put themselves out to do difficult work um, that maybe are sort of beyond my purview, basically because I just do the work. Um, and I think most people who do this, we just do the work. We worry about everything else later, we just do the work. Um, but I, I certainly think, I mean, that was a very good question. I think I'm stumped on, but it certainly got my wheels spinning. And I think it's a beautiful and wonderful question I think we all need to be attentive to. I think bringing up the fact that there is this tension um, and we have not yet quite figured out how to not make our, not do double the work, right? To not only n learn the best practices of our profession, to not only be the best teachers that we can be by way of these professional organizations and accreditation bodies and teacher education institutions, right? To not only meet those standards, but also stay in tune with what we think and feel is the best way to be. I think we need to stay alive to that tension. I'm not sure that we that we found some way to reconcile those, but I, I appreciate you offering it to the group. I think we need to actually. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. But I want to say a very loving thank you. Thank you. To Dr. Lloyd. Thank you. I, I will ask people to please join us here again on Monday, March 16th for the fourth installment.